in an hour on BBC One. Now, here's Alan Titchmarsh. I'm a great fan of the Antiques Roadshow, and here on the 20th Century Roadshow, we're going to be looking at everything that we've grown up with over the last century, and finding out which of those things that we live with today are likely to become the antiques of tomorrow. If I said that today's show was coming from the Science Museum, you wouldn't naturally think of a pastoral scene like this, would you? But this is Rawton, near Swindon, and it hides a big secret. It has its very own Science Museum. Eighteen thousand objects are lovingly cared for in these hangars, and they range from nuclear missiles to airliners, trams and buses. They also have more domestic items and computers like Ernie, who generated random numbers for the premium bonds draw. But this was no speedy computer. It took an astonishing ten days to come up with them. These cavernous hangars were lying empty until the Science Museum saw them as a solution to a growing problem. They could use them to store thousands of items that they couldn't display or preserve themselves. And just some of these items are the eye-catching backdrop for our roadshow today. Our queue of expectant people are hoping to get lucky with their prized possessions and discover that lurking in the bubble wrap is a 20th century collectible. Our hand-picked experts specialise in anything from cut glass to Star Wars toys, so let's get on down and see what comes through those hangar doors. Well, this is a true splash of colour, isn't it, really? I mean, it's amazing to see. Mm. Joe, where did you find these? Well, there's a little story behind this. Uh, my wife and I were on holiday in Belgium, and um, we were in Brussels, uh, that part of the tour, and um, on a Sunday morning, it was a beautiful day, so we decided to go for a walk by the Grand Place. So we joined the hordes, looking around the flea market, and at the corner of my eye, um, I saw a box which had one of th this, this top one here, yeah. with a lid open, and I saw it and I thought, wow, what's that? And at closer inspection, I realised that uh, they didn't have one plate, but uh, six of them. And I just thought they were so unusual that I had to buy them. Well, I think out of the corner of your eye, I mean, you could not miss these, could you? No. I mean, even if there was a, a tiny section of this poking out from a box, I think you'd, you'd easily spot it. They're you? quite bright. Now, do you know anything about them? No, unfortunately not. I would imagine that they could be possibly 50s or 60s, but apart from that, I don't really know too much about them. The shapes are just so organic, aren't they? They just they smack, are. They smack are. of 1950s. It's nice to sort of turn over because you've got very distinct maker's mark there, haven't yes. you? I mean, painted on in bold lettering, R. Bryce, Biot, and Roland Bryce was working out of Biot, which is in the south of France, and he actually was a pupil of Ferdinand Léger, the French Cubist painter. Really? Uh, yes, and I think the sort of, the, the colour, the style and the motifs used are very, very leger. I mean, they sort of feel kind of that, that, that whole sort of move from cubism into surrealism. And this particular charge, I mean, that is just like an explosion on, you know, on a plate, which is great. Did you do some haggling? You have to do haggling. You don't have you? to do haggling. You have to do haggling. With my worst possible French, I knocked him down from, I think it was um, 80 pounds to 65 pounds. For the, for the set? For the set, yes. Well, that's pretty good going, is isn't it? it? That's pretty good going. Well, yes, it is good going. I think you'd get around about £100 for, for the plates, each plate, each oh, right. plate. Okay. And this charger, which is you know, a very decent size and quite dramatic, um, I think certainly two to £300, if not a bit more. Oh, gosh, as much as that. With the wind behind it on a good day. <laughs> well, it was so, a good day. It was a very good buy. 
well done and all all great vibrant 50s designs that you know are unrepeatable today really yes well thank you very much indeed thank you for bringing them in Pleasure. You are a Pez Popper extraordinaire. I am, yes. How many have you got? I think I've got over 400 now. 400? And you've been collecting for how long? Since about 1987. And how much do they cost you? Um, they, they're about a pound, about 99p. But you've been to, to America, you're telling me. About, I have, yeah. And, and collecting huge numbers over there? Yeah, I went travelling and had to send all of them back to my mum and dad because I couldn't carry them in my rucksack. <laughs> but you can get them for about a dollar as well. So. Plenty of scope here for wonderful collections, mm -hmm. but your earliest one you've got here is... Oldest one is the Batman, from about 1970. But of course they go 70s. back to the early 50s, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yes. You don't have 50s. any from that period? No, no, What's they're quite hard to get hold of. Your favourite one? Favourite one is Mini Gonzo, which is a key ring. I like to have them in their wrappers. Of course. And if I want to use them, then I'll just buy two. I only bought one of those, but I had to open them because he was so cute. So <laughs> cuteness counts a lot, does it? For me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's this one? Well, this one's actually a Taz one, but I have just put a new packet in there if you want to try. Oh, do they taste the same? Always did. They do, yeah. Oh, oh let's one. have a look. Mmm. It brings back all those memories. <laughs> Thank you ever so much. No problem. What have you brought? All your dolls? Yeah. Who's she? Sasha. Sasha, have you had her a long time? Yeah. It's your mum's. <gasps> <gasps> Crumbs, I better not touch it and break it. So what have you brought me here? It's a present uh, that was brought to my grandfather in about the early 50s and uh, used to buy me these interesting presents and of course I didn't quite know what it was until I opened it. So what's inside? Ah! It's a portable record player. Fantastic! But it opens up so you can take uh, all sizes of records up Look to Look at the way inch. it all folds out. That's yes. extraordinary. It's in, inside the lid is a uh, container for the, for the, for the needles. needles as yes, well. Yes, with instructions to use once only. So do you think Intrigued. it was second-hand when, it, when I would you think it? So. Oh yes, no, undoubtedly second-hand. It certainly wasn't new when I had it. No, it was what we're looking at here is a, is, a, is, a, is a portable gramophone that would have been produced between the wars. Right. But well, my first observation is actually that it's in extraordinarily good condition. Good. And the other thing that I've noticed here is the speaker uh, is actually part of the, the mechanism itself. Yes. It, that's yes. what I love about it as well. Yes. Um, if we look at the box in more detail, I see that it's actually been painted to look like timber. Have you ever noticed that? That's a point, yes, I haven't. Yes. So after all those 50 years, you've no, not actually seen... I haven't even noticed that. No, I just noticed it was a brown colour, yeah. And, and, and they did that to actually make a look uh, more expensive than it probably was. It's nice to see that the handle is all here. So as far as I can see, you've got a very much as a working gramophone. Yes. Now the history of gramophones really goes back to the beginning of the 20th century and that's very what's so exciting about this machine is that here we are talking about 20th century items and this is really the pioneering you know cutting edge of technology and it, it was Emil Berliner who in the 1890s invented what we really regard as the gramophone. Right. And by 1910 he had turned his company into producing these machines and his company was called HMV which still is still in existence know. today. Yes, yes. I think it's fantastic. Good. And because it's in such great condition, I could put a value, I could easily see that selling at auction between three and four hundred pounds. Good. Oh, that's very good. I think it's a great machine. Now, does it work? It does, yes. It takes up to 12-inch records. All right. Should I have to... I'd love to hear it. Right. Well, we'll... Um... getting louder and louder. There's no volume control. This is such a great toy. Thanks so much for bringing it in. Um, it's not the sort of toy that I'd, being very sexist, I'd, ex I'd expect to see with a with a girl, but does it work? It does work, yes. It see does. it. And it makes a lot of noise as well. It Light should, flashing. It should take a picture in a minute. Ah, oh, something's, something's, it looks as though she's not oh, actually... No, there oh, she did goes. she... There she goes. Yeah, she's taking a picture. She's taking a picture of you. <laughs> Great toy, in fantastic condition. So, was this something you bought? No, our parents bought it for us. Um, we don't really know when they bought it for us. We've got memories of about 1980, when we lived abroad. Um, I think that my mum and dad bought it then, but I can't be 100% sure of that, so. Where was abroad? Um, we lived in Sardinia, 
so not too bad yeah it was good fun so what was your dad your dad was working there obviously. dad was in the air force so um, I don't know whether they got it from a market out there or a toy shop well let's just have a look at it because it's made of tin plate it's lithographed it's got these nice chrome details the figures are plastic soft plastic we can see here squidgy heads <laughs> Squid squidgy heads <laughs> just see nothing on the bottom on the inside here it says made in China and it's basically a model of a I suppose based loosely on a Rolls Royce yeah what I also like people get sick of me saying have you got the original box but it does make a big difference because here we do have the box yeah and it says everything first of all I don't think the Trade Descriptions Act will allow you to have that sort of image with that inside because it looks slightly glitzier on the on the cover than it, it does yeah, in real it life actually. and I love this mystery action horn sounding headlights flashing when it starts the girl taking photo when it stops the big era of this sort of toy was in yes. Japan just after the Second World War and Japan really was incredibly clever at building up its yeah, toy right. production but then of course where Japan led China followed and China then began to produce their own toys copies of the Japanese ones in the 1960s and 70s so I actually think that this is more likely to be mm, early 1970s and did you have a really a really sad childhood because you're obviously never allowed to play with this toy because it's in such creamy condition <laughs> and we were allowed to play with it I think to be honest with you that the horn is such a horrible sound we didn't want to play with it I don't think it got put in a box it does sound as if there's some small animal it's trapped just inside. so annoying <laughs> yeah and we had lots and lots of toys you know so we were quite lucky we had lots of things to play with and I think that probably was a little bit on the annoying side sort of big wow look at this and then yeah. no and put, put it away. in a box yeah value hmm it does have a value uh, because it? it has this kind of novelty aspect to it yeah. um, and it's in good condition in its box I would have thought we're talking about perhaps 200 250 pounds I wouldn't have expected that at all so not only is it fun but yeah. it's also worth looking after <laughs> Just look at that, isn't that great? I used to go to school on a bus like that, and I can still feel that spiky fabric on the seats digging into the backs of my legs. I was wearing shorts in those days. <laughs> well, I've left the hurly-burly and the crowds behind now and come to Hangar L4 to talk to Marta Liscard. Marta, you're one of the conservators at the Science Museum. Where do all your objects come from? We get our objects from many different places. They get donated by the manufacturer, from the companies that use them, by individuals that kept them for various reasons, and sometimes from other institutions. How do you decide what goes in the collection? What constitutes a classic? A classic, to us, is an object of particular importance, either technologically, scientifically, perhaps to the um, overall public, so culturally. You come here and you're suddenly made aware of how important a lot of things domestically surrounding you at the moment are. And you take this so much for granted. Are people surprised at what they find here? People are always very surprised, especially when they see the things that they use themselves. Not, not just their grandmothers or their great-grandmothers, but things that they even might have in their own homes right at the moment. I love the lawnmowers. I mean, they got me very excited, but then they would, wouldn't they? I would think so. We've just acquired them, actually, and the lawnmowers are, are sort of an interesting story because they come from another collection, uh, collected by a family who went into lawnmower collecting for their children's sake, really, because it gave them something to ride on that was safe. There are poignant things in this collection, too. There's a, a wagon over there, which is a TB screening unit, which I suppose speaks of a particular period in our history, and people must get in touch with their past so easily with some of these things. It's interesting to see how a lot of objects that you would never think would have a certain effect on people really do affect people. I mean, a TB van, you might expect people to be touched by that. But it's funny, a, a kind of cooker will set somebody off because it's reminded them of somebody in their family. You will, I suppose, get some people coming in looking at things and saying, well, why bother? What's the point in, in remembering? I think the point in remembering is that we, so that we don't make the mistakes that we've done in the past. 
particularly important with a technological collection is the fact that that's the carbon burning era. And we know what we're doing to the planet because it's of the carbon burning area. We are busily destroying the planet, trying to maintain our level of living. If we don't keep these objects for the future, nobody will understand what we did in the past. favourite frocks you wore in the 60s? Yes, they were. And yes. why didn't you throw them away? I think they were just so lovely. I love the colours, the styles, everything. So I just hung on to them. Yes. Typically, I think people, they never forget the clothes they wore in their teens and early 20s oh, no. and quite often <laughs> keep them and attics across yes. the country, I'm sure, have sort of 60s classics and 70s classics. Oh yes, I'm sure. Now with these ones, these aren't very valuable, but it, it really shows styles of the 60s yes. to the early 70s. Yes, it does. And when we started off, when you were Jackie Kennedy, absolutely, weren't you? Absolutely, absolutely. Rather elegant, nice <laughs> Jackie Kennedy. Then I thought this somehow, this is Brit Eklund to me. With her hair up, no, late 60s, you've got that, that slightly more psychedelic look, which, you know, comes into oh, clothes yes. Yes. of that period, moving into complete drug-induced mad 60s. <laughs> I mean, look at those trousers. Did you really wear these? Absolutely, I did. I wore them loads of times. In My friend and I shared them. Did you? And did you did. fight over who'd have them? Yes, we did. And you won? Yes. No, they belong to her actually, but uh, the hem would go up and down, yeah. I mean, depending who was wearing them. There's quite a lot of demand for this sort of very <laughs> extreme 60s stuff at the moment. The 60s clothes that make the big money is the big names. You, you really want sort of Mary Quant, mm. Bieber, I mean I don't know if you ever had any of that. Yes, I did. And Mary she, Quant originals. And you threw it away? I don't think I actually threw them away, but... I think I probably just gave them away. Gave them away. Well, probably to a jumble sale. Things like this, I mean, there's nothing worth more than about £20. <laughs> but these things, they're fun. It's party time. Oh, yes. And they're nice memories. And when we have kids, they want to wear them too. Because stuff like this, it's cool again. So hang on to it <laughs> and wear it. I can't get into it now. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody will do. It's all right. <laughs> You've brought along a book that really caught my eye because it represents all the high glamour of the early part of the 20th century. Mm. Now tell me, how did you come by it? Well, it's my husband's sister. Uh, it was her book because she worked for Norman Hartman. Well, let's have a little look inside because you say your, it's your sister-in-law, isn't it? Yes. And Norman Hartnell has actually dedicated this book to her, to Joan, to Joan yes. Bradford. Right. And she was a tailoress and she made skirts and suits and coats coats and things were her speciality right as opposed to sort of big ball gowns yes. and things. i don't know that she worked on any ball gowns but well let's have a look at some of these wonderful designs because norman hart now really put british dressmaking on the map didn't he he brought it to the point of national and worldwide oh, yes. significance and if we look at some of the designs you're you're dead right we've got beautiful 1930s 40s dresses made for mm. the leading actresses are, of the day yes. this one here for Gertrude Lawrence and also of course the pinnacle of his career the design for the coronation dress for Her yes. Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II right. and that really is quite an achievement oh, for any dressmaker isn't it it's yes. really is mm. the high point in his career well I think it's a beautiful thing for your sister-in-law to have given to you and it's a fantastic glittering social document really oh, yes. on the high glamour of the day yes we couldn't afford that a book like this normally, which is, of course is out of print now, it was published in 1955, yes. you could probably pick up in a second-hand booksellers for maybe £20-£30. But yeah. because it's got this dedication to your sister-in-law and the fact that she was a tailoress yes. for Norm Hartnell, I think it gives it just special significance. Mm. And for a collector, that could make it worth double or even more if two people really, really wanted it. So I love it. I wouldn't part with it now. She gave it to me to use and I will pass it on to my daughter because she likes to do sewing as well. So it will go down in the family. Wouldn't part with it. I understand that uh, it's a family piece. It is. Um, my husband's granny 
Fortin when she was in her 20s in Paris. She was a nurse and she was studying and in fact she was one of the first nurses on the beaches in Salonika and she bought them when she was there. Well, as you know, um, it's by uh, Lalique, um, largely because his name is written large and bold on the piece, and the company Lalique still exists today, but René Lalique, the founder of the company, whose R. Lalique, uh, his name appears engraved on this piece, is perhaps the world's most famous glassmaker, and probably the most desirable. His work is very distinctive, um, with this opalescent effect that you see in there created with chemicals. Now this is a piece of pressed glass. I mean it has very little intrinsic value. It's it's very simple. It's almost made on the sort of principle of, of a jam jar. It's it's not a sophisticated piece really. But what Lalique did was he created designs which were instantly popular and he commanded big money for simply made glass. The design is known as the coquille dish, the shell You've got mm -hmm. four scallop shells that form the, oh, yes. form the pattern. Uh, coquille is French. I didn't notice that before. For, for shell. And how long have you owned them? Uh, about three years. Yes. Well, there you have four, four scallop shells that form the design. It's probably his most common pattern. And how much do you reckon that's worth then? Well, I know Lalique's reasonably valuable. And I would have thought in the range of 100, 150 pounds, something along those lines. Well, one of these is 200, 250 and... Mm -hmm. Do you oh, have wow. any more? Uh, yeah, I have uh, six of them all together. So you have uh, a, a set that is worth about fifteen hundred pounds. Really? Oh wow! So, despite the fact that they are formed by base uh, materials and base methods, I cherish them and look after them really well. I, I will. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming in. Thanks. And now for a design treat. It was a classic in its own era, and it still has thousands of aficionados today, the Mini. And to tell us all about it, a man who has all the right credentials, not only is he a presenter of Top Gear, but he's also bonkers about Minis, James May. Evening, Alan. Is this your own? It is. You're disappointed, <laughs> aren't you? You thought I'd have a new Ferrari or I something. I did rather, man in yeah. your position. How did you come by this? Well, actually, I didn't mean to buy it. Um, I'm quite a fan of the Mini. I've had several in my youth. Um, one night after a session of drinking, I suppose you'd call it, with my colleague Richard Hammond. We went on eBay having a look at what sort of minis were available. Uh, I must have made a bid, because when I woke up the next day there was an email saying, congratulations. <laughs> you yeah. just bought them. And it was in Buxton, and I live in London, so I had to go on the train and the bus to get it. What led to the minis development? Because it was quite an iconoclastic moment in automotive history, wasn't it? Well, it, it, yes, it was, it was a radical departure for an, an industry that it was essentially stuck with pre-war ideas. This was in the 1950s. But what really spurred it was, first of all, we had the Suez Crisis. So people thought petrol was forever going to be in short supply. So economy became important. Also, back then, believe it or not, 45 years ago, people were already worried about congestion in cities and the problem of parking. So what they wanted was a frugal, essentially utilitarian car. This was reckoned to be the answer. The Mini was born. The Mini! We've got to make a car for the housewife, which is economical to run, and has lots of shopping space inside. The Morris Mini Minor. There's so much room for four people, and so much parcel space. It's part of our era, really, and it's going back to yeah. the 60s. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a time when we was having fun and the swinging Min 60s, you know. It Min is, it's, minutes were the thing. They really took off. You drive a modern car and you're kind of floating, but in these you, you feel you're driving. It's, it's, it's driving as opposed to just being transported. They're a small car with, with probably a big heart. I know that sounds like a bit of a cliche, but there's every, everyone is individual. They're not just a Nike, and they're your pet, they, you know. They grow around you like a child. <laughs> small on the outside, big on the inside, British made. <laughs> well, it is British made still just, yes. but had they any idea it was going to be the hit that it was? No, I don't think they, they, they can have seen just how long it would stay in production and just what a, what a cult thing it, it would be. Um, but one of the things that makes the... Well, two things make the Mini great. First is that it is brilliant fun to drive. It's very simple. You feel its simplicity when you drive. You're in touch with every last little mechanical thing that's going on. The other thing is, if you're a young man, as I was once when I had my first Mini, 
They are cheap to buy, cheap to insure, and the bits are ludicrously cheap. For example, in the last couple of days, somebody's backed into mine. They've, they've bent the spotlights back, and the radiator grills, you can probably see it's a bit caved in. But to be honest, I can just sort of <laughs> gradually pull it back into shape with my teeth or my fingers. And, it, you know, and if I do need to replace it, that's going to cost 20 quid or something. It's just, it, it's bicycle spares money. Now, that is not the case with its successor absolutely this not. chap over here which has got bmw behind it now now Completely. still still a bonnie car though isn't it a very good car um great fun to drive very nicely made nicely equipped all the rest of it but as far as being a mini is concerned i think it is a bit of a fraud this is another case i'm afraid to say of the germans treating the british car industry as their sort of party fancy dress they've they've made it look a bit like a mini they put you know the essential styling cues on the cuteness and so on but um there are several things that aren't quite right. Firstly, the original Mini was, in its time, a radical car. The way the engine was arranged and the packaging and the amount of space they liberated and so on. This isn't a radical car. This is actually under the, It's a very good car and it's good fun to well, drive. Well, my daughter loves hers. Yeah, well, people do. I mean, they are brilliant <laughs> fun, but it's a very, very conventional car. And if you were going to make a radical small hatchback these days, you wouldn't actually do it like this. They've compromised the boot space and the interior space to make it look cool. The other thing, of course, is it isn't small. Look at the size. Yeah, it's absolutely yeah. vast. So it's a fraud, but it's a fun fraud. It's, it's an excellent fraud, yes. It's a good piece of reproduction furniture. And the thing is, will it still be here in 40 years like that one? Well, I, I think if you're still doing this in 40 years, Alan, I hope you are, um, and you do another piece about cars, I'm inclined to think you'll still have the original on the show because it will still be a more significant thing. Despite appearances, this is a remarkably comfortable chair. Um, I've probably got a crisscross pattern on yeah. me now, actually, but no, it is, it is actually a very comfortable chair. It's called a diamond chair, and it was designed by an American designer called Harry Batoya. In fact, it was designed around about 1950, 52. I have to say, this is a design classic as far as I'm concerned. How, how do you happen to have it? How did you come across it? Um, we bought a house about six, seven years ago. Yes. And it had been used as a language school. Right. And so it had been fairly abused, the house. And this was just lying in the garden, covered in rust, falling quietly lying to pieces. Lying in the garden. <laughs> so I have to ask you some questions, because there's a few things I've noticed about this chair. Um, there are quite a few little sort of weld spots on it. And I noticed that it's actually got a, a, a matte paint black finish on it. Now, in fact, actually, when this chair was first made, it was actually covered in what I call a powder finish. Mm. And obviously that doesn't exist on it anymore. So that obviously answers my question. The interesting thing about this chair is it's a very flexible chair. It's an experiment with form. Yeah. And in fact, Harry Batoya, when he first designed this chair, thought it could be mechanically made but they actually found out that it was far easier to make it by hand. Yeah. So it's a very sprung chair, and in fact, if the welds go, it springs all over the place. Yeah. Uh, it would be a lot more comfortable if it had its seat pad with it, <laughs> and it is meant to have a flat I've seat pad. I've never seen pad. one. You haven't I've seen never one? never seen one. They do the come with seat pads, oh, and that right. does make a difference. But having said that, I think they look good yeah. like this. Yeah. I mean, Batoya, he was born in 1915. Um, I think he died in around about 1978. And his, his furniture is very distinctive. It's very sculptural. You'd think it was much later because of the shape and... Um it's, Absolutely. It's very modern Absolutely. looking. I thought it was much later. I but when we look at difference. furniture like this, or mid-century furniture, um, it's very much ahead of its time, a lot mm. of it. It really is. And mm. I, I think this is an absolute classic and stunning looking chair. Now, I have to be honest with you, because of the life it's had, essentially, it's a little bit problematic in putting a value on it. Mm. Because it's got weld problems and because it hasn't essentially got its original finish on it, instead of being worth several hundred pounds, I'll be frank with you, it's probably only worth around about a hundred pounds. So it's a little bit of a shame, but that doesn't belittle it. In terms it's still of, lovely. Absolutely. In yeah. terms of its, its function, its design, it's a classic piece and it works really, really well. And I'm glad that you resurrected it. Yeah. Well, nice I'm, at hundred pounds, I'll leave it in the garden. Several hundred pounds, I'll put no, it somewhere No, bring it back else. inside. Bring it back inside. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we have it on the patio, and, and that's where we Fine. sit well, and enjoy it. It's good to see it, and yeah. thank you very much for bringing it. Lovely. Along. Thank Thanks you. very much indeed. We have links for ten tyres. My brother-in-law lives down there. He's been there all his life. My husband is a Cornishman, so we visit ten tyres all the time. But when the last time I went to see my brother-in-law, he had this thing stuck up against the wall and didn't, and was packing it up, I think. And I said, oh, that's lovely. What is it? He said, oh, he said, um, you can have it if you want it. And I said, oh, thank you very much. Yes, I will.
It's a, it's a beautiful painting. You I mean, like you it? I'm glad you like it. Absolutely beautiful painting. And yeah. I believe it to be by the artist Mary Jules. And she probably worked on, on what I believe to be a, a sort of scrap piece of material, mm. which is very much in keeping mm. with the whole sort of uh, ethos of that time. And she was self-taught, according to her, but she had contact with various very well-known 20th century artists of her day, uh, Cedric Morris, and um, also uh, Ben Nicholson and Christopher Wood, yeah, who are two major yeah. 20th century yeah. names, yeah. really sort of liked her work and saw it. Yeah. And uh, I just think it's self-evident when you look at it, it's, it's got all the makings of, of a really, really good painting. Oh, I'm glad you like it. You've got, oh, you're welcome. It's, it's got a, a figure which always inhabits you know, buildings and uh, yeah. has the intimacy of, of a place like St. Ives. It feels like it. Yes, yeah, because so, I love St. Ives. And has a um, yeah. slight touch of expressionism in the sky, using a sort of green in the sky. It's yeah, quite a non-conventional use. Yeah. She doesn't turn up in auction all that often. And no, the prices well. seem to range from sort of mid to high hundreds to sort of mid, maybe lowish mid thousands. But mm. I could see this easily making you know, between one and two thousand at auction. Oh yes, I dare say it would. If, if it is more, a Mary Jules, I think I mean, it's quite I... rare. Oh do you? I, yeah. I was hoping it would be a Mary Jules, but I wasn't at all I'm sure, sure it is. I'm sure it is. I can't wait to tell my brother-in-law. <laughs> Air hostesses of the near future. Girls who really aim high when it comes to choosing a career. But nothing is more disconcerting to the passenger than a lurching air hostess who tumbles in one's lap. They're all very smart and charming. It turned out the winner was Maureen Dale, Miss B.O.A.C. Yes, a British victory. The hostess with the mostest. Some of the first airline stewardesses back in the 1950s served in cramped planes like this behind me. And believe it or not, there are aficionados who collect their uniforms now, like you, Cliff Musket. I gather your flat at home is absolutely packed with stewardesses' uniforms. It's quite packed, but I have a big apartment and I have lots of space to store my uniforms. And how long have you been collecting them? I've been collecting for a little longer than 12 years. So um, before that time I had four uniforms, but the other uniforms were obtained after 1992. Let's just have a look at the collection back in your flat in Amsterdam. Sure. I think they believe that I wear the uniforms and I go out, party, and, but that's not the case. I don't wear the uniforms, I just collect them. This is the first closet where I have my uniforms stowed. Here are some uniforms and there are some more here. I'd like to show you my first uniform I got in 1980. It's a KLM uniform. I got it through a friend of my mother's. Uh, who was a nurse and also a part-time stewardess and uh, she gave it to me and this is how I started my collection. Let's go upstairs and see more of my collection. At the moment I have approximately 340, 350 uniforms from different carriers. My collection is growing every day because I get new uniforms to add to my collection so that's a good thing. I get a kick out of it. You know, when I get a uniform, I'm like, yes, another item for my collection. I can make pictures and put it on my website and show the world what I have. I knew I wanted to be a flight attendant and um, my dream came true when I was 21. I got a position at KLM and I'm still holding that position and I'm very happy with my job. The uniforms I have are very valuable to me, of course, because they're like my... Uh, I wanted to say babies. <laughs> no. Some of the uniforms are uh, worth a lot of money, especially the uniforms from the 60s and the 50s. All my items are insured, but still, you know, even if you pay me lots of money, I'm not interested in the money at this moment. I just want my uniform collection. Well, Keith Lovegrove has joined us now. You're an expert in airline culture, Keith. That is quite some collection. It's, have you seen anything a, like that it's before? It's a fabulous collection. It's so great to have it under one roof. It's just, it must be quite a responsibility. Cliff, what started you? Why stewardesses uniform? 
Um, I like civil aviation. I like everything that has to do with civil aviation, airplanes, airports, and also the uniforms. Yeah. So that's how I started my collection. I used to collect everything, like postcards and labels and timetables. But you had more wardrobes than cupboards, so you thought you might as well stick with the uniforms. Right. Is there one that you still haven't managed to lay your hands on, one special one that you're after? There are many, but I like to have the annual Zealand uniform. I have no uniforms from New Zealand, so it would be a nice item to add to my collection. Dealer Holiday coming on over there. Well, look, you very kindly brought some of your uniforms. We've got a quick fashion show coming up. Sure. So first, we have Delta Airlines. Now, when's this Fabulous. from? This is 1958, and uh, it, amazingly, this is um, over a decade after the Second World War, but there's still a semblance of military style about this uniform with, with um, a hint of the khaki about the form yes, there isn't there really? yeah, this is this is the summer one i think it's a summer it? uniform summer right. the, uh, the skirt well below the knee of course yes decorous in the 50s yeah. united airlines now look at this, this is, we're talking from this, the this is this is my favorite it's it's fabulous it's so simple um designed by john louis yes that's right yeah. uh 1968 and uh, what's wonderful about it, it's so simple and it's so Captain Scarlet. Here comes Braniff. Oh, look this at this. This is Braniff and this is wonderful. You could wear this with or without the trousers. And this was in the early 70s when the adage sex sells seats became famous. So and sure. Emilio Pucci has signed the front of the skirt, which is quite nice. Well, two different colours, this colour and pink. Yeah. Let's see British Caledonian. Ah, you see, now yeah. much this more stayed, one, aren't we? Yeah. These came in the early 70s, and I remember the, the, uh, the B-Cal stewardesses, as we used to call them, coming through Gatwick Airport in the early 1970s, and they really turned heads. They so so, in there. so distinctive, but what was really distinctive, when they got off the other end, in a desert Middle Eastern <laughs> destination. Wearing tweed. Yes. Oh, now here we have oh, Sahara <laughs> and Pakistan Airlines. Yeah. This is real national identity. Um, Sahara Airlines is a domestic uh, airline in India uh, with the Salwar Kameez. Beautiful, so elegant. And of course the Sari yeah. for Pakistan International is just great. Easy jets. Let's see what we get for, for not much money. It's a right. low cost carrier and the uniform is very low yes, cost. Yes. Very I, simple. Mm, mm. So I know it's low cost, but I think it's appalling, I'm sorry. The, the, the stewardess is, is, is part of the corporate identity of the, of the airline, and of course in this case it's low budget, but also the stewardess needs to have an air of authority about her. She needs to be able to tell a grown man or woman to sit down and belt up. So we've seen 1958 right to the present day. Yeah. What a collection. Of course, they'll change them every year, Cliff, so you're, you're quids in, really, aren't you? It's been lovely to see them. Thank you very much indeed, Cliff Thank you. Cliff. Thank you. Just outside the hangar, people have parked up their classic cars for our vintage vehicle buff, Philip Serrell, to drool over. Cresta. Correct. Year 1962. 1962. She's really great, isn't she? All fins and chrome. When did you buy her? I bought it in 1980. And how much did you pay for it? Uh, three seven five. Why did you buy a Cresta? Um, I just love the back seat. That's a real courting seat, isn't it? It is absolutely. But look at that front bench seat as well. I think it's absolutely wonderful. And I love it because you've got the original number plate. Yeah. A lot of cars of this vintage were sold by the owners because the plates are worth more than the car. I reckon this car today is worth about four thousand pounds. Right. Interesting thing though, most classic car owners, they spend a lot more on their cars than they're worth. So you bought this £375 yep. 24 years ago. How much have you spent on it? Um, probably £3,000. You're doing better than most. You're ahead of the game. Not bad. This sun visor, is that a sort of optional extra? Yep, that was uh, one of the extras that went with it. Uh, and what else could you have got? Uh, a radio and the Philips car record player. Record player? Yep. I've got to listen to this. <laughs> That's great stuff, isn't it? Rock. That's really good, isn't it? <laughs> Amy, it's such a treat to be able to sit here. Imagine I'm I'm in the 1950s, early 60s, and to talk about Pyrex. <laughs> It's a collectible that that nobody thinks really is collectible. That's right. Um, and. I mean, where did you find these pieces? They were given to me as uh, wedding presents. 
that, you lucky thing. And when did you get married then? Um, 1961. Well, the designs um, are actually, and the colours are very 1950s. Um, so I think they were actually around really from, from the mid 50s right through into the 1960s. Which is your favourite? Have you got a, a real love here? Well, I think the pink one really. I use them all, so. <laughs> so you're, you're still using this today? Oh, yes. So when did you last use this? Um, Yesterday. La <laughs> last week. <laughs> last week? <laughs> Fantastic. Value wise, um, well. Not much. <laughs> no, it's really, really up and coming. And the marketplace is, is definitely in the States at the moment. But in Britain, we're getting very interesting colour Pyrex. These large salad bowls, mm. I think you would see those going for 22, 25 pounds a piece. Oh, right. Uh, if not a little bit more than that. And this little fellow here, I think happily, because of his nice condition, nice printing, he's still not a, not a mark on him, not a crack anywhere. Probably 15 to 18 pounds. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, imagine if you had more of this. Yes. You could be a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> a millionaire with a, with a very fashionable kitchen, no less. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, Amy, for bringing it in. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> now, the visitors here to Rawton range from the casually interested to the dedicated enthusiast, and some of the most popular exhibits are the aeroplanes. Now, there is one that was tested not far from here at Fairford in Gloucestershire that inspires real passion among its followers. And since its decommissioning in 2003, one well-heeled enthusiast has even spent £300,000 on a nose cone. You've guessed, haven't you? Concord. And she rose. Concord accelerates. Rotate. All's going well, she's airborne. Zero, zero, 002 flies well ahead of the predicted time. Well, 50,000 people in Britain and France worked on Concorde during its development, and they've all got their own stories to tell, and their own collectibles. Two of them are Brian and Mo Bolton. Now, you two met because of Concorde, didn't you? That's right. Um, I came back from Toulouse, uh, Mo was working in the medical centre and... Uh, so, were, uh, you were a nurse? Yes, that's right. I used to look after the people who looked after the aircraft. And you looked after it, so she looked after you? Yes. That's right. yeah. All the jabs that went in. Yeah. yeah, they used to call us Dracula's daughters, my colleague and I, because we were always sticking needles in. <laughs> were you scared? Because, I mean, flying at twice the speed of sound, never been done before. Wow. That many people. No, I, I was one... I was one of the chosen few that actually cleared the aircraft to fly um, and then invariably you, it sounds you flew with it, you know. No, there, there were some hairy moments, yeah, surely, yeah. But, uh, Including, I mean, we've got the emergency procedure here now, this flash supersonic aircraft, the way you get off it in an emergency is with a rope. Yes, I well... Mean, <laughs> you didn't take the technology quite that far then, didn't you, to the emergency? No, no, it no, it works. It works, it works, it works. Yes, yes, we did evacuate... Uh, Fire that rope on one trip. Yeah. Oh, were there worries about flying at that sort of speed? There were a lot of people who had some very peculiar ideas about what would happen to you when they were training the stewardesses from the various airlines. One of them came to the medical centre and said, if I fly on Concorde, will I be able to get pregnant? So we said, well, it depends who's on the crew, really. You know. <laughs> and uh, it's since been proved there were no problems. No right? problems. Yeah. Was it a different plane to work on compared with others? I haven't, I mean, I was only working on the flight testing. I haven't actually worked with aeroplanes before, but uh, the enthusiasm, the people that worked on it was wonderful. It's the, one of the best places I had ever worked. I've never pe seen people so keen on what they were doing. So a great sadness when it was decommissioned. Terrible. Terrible. Oh, Terrible. very much so, yes, yes. But you still have not only the flight manual, Look at that. So this presumably was the original one, it was prototype number one. This is the aircrew man manual for, for the very first aircraft. That was the Bible, in fact. And that was... I won't try and understand it. <laughs> <laughs> and here. Well, this is yes, that's... Uh, this, that was part of a tour. Part of the, the tour in 1972, where uh, we visited various countries. And uh, we had to uh, behave like a normal airliner, which we... We did quite easily, in fact, and, and that's all the menus and uh, tickets that we used, etc., etc. Happy days. Wonderful. More than, more than happy days, yes. yes.
thank you very much for bringing this fantastic collection you of Star welcome. Wars to the show. Very pleased you brought it along. This is my favourite line of toys. Really? I was wondering if you could tell me how you came about finding them. Well, um, I have two children, unfortunately a girl and a boy, and obviously these were my sons. Right. He's now in his early 30s, mm -hmm. and um, I've kept all the toys actually from when they were born. So you have other toys in, in your lot. attic and, and yeah. things as well? I just went up there this morning and brought out the tin of uh, people, and this is Excellent. some of them from out of the tin. Excellent. It's a, it's a lovely collection, and what's great about this collection is that all the figures you have here are in really nice condition, and a lot of them have all the original weapons. And with Star Wars toys, the, the big value is in the actual little tiny weapons that come with all the figures, oh, right. and not necessarily natural figures themselves. Oh. So it's great that you have all these figures here with the weapons, and a whole pile there to go with the other ones you've probably still got in your loft. Well, yes, because I have got some of the big uh, things, you know, the flying things yes. and the big dogs and things like Excellent. that. Excellent, that's the really good. So that's good, is it? Yeah, definitely. There's some bits that we can see over in this pole here, right. uh, which are from some of the vehicles you're talking about oh, as right. well. And this particular piece here is actually from uh, the Atat. Oh, right. And the Atat is one of the most popular Star Wars pieces. And this gun alone is, is worth 15 to 20 pounds on, on its own and makes up most of the value of the actual vehicle. Oh, gosh. With, with these toys here, a lot of them are actually quite common uh, and, and they, they range in price, but the, the most important figure is, is actually this little chap here, oh, and he, he's known as Yoda. Oh, right. Yoda's one of the most popular characters in the because he appeared in, in Empire Strikes Back, and uh, he, he's got all his bits here, including the cane, the snake, the belt, and the coat. Which he's really is, cute, is isn't what he? It's a very nice figure, and uh, he, he was one of the one of the main characters, and oh, people right. really, really do look for this figure. So that that is the best figure in all the collection you have here. Uh, on their own, these figures, uh, without the weapons, and unfortunately, they don't hold as much value. No. But do you have any idea at all of what value these figures might have? No, not really. I just know that my son really enjoyed playing with them. And of course, with having a girl as well, she had her Cindy toys, and he used to shoot the Cindy toys, the Cindy dolls, and everything, and all the furniture. So there was warfare in the house warfare, with all the toys. Completely. Fantastic. Well, generally these toys, apart from the Yoda figure, all the ones behind are, are worth in between three to ten pounds. Right. Uh, the figures on their own, without weapons, are worth one to two. Some of them a little bit more, depending on the character. But but the main characters we've seen is the Yoda, and the Yoda would be worth 15 to 25 in that really nice mint condition oh, on its own. So as a collection, it's a really nice lot, and with extra pieces you have in your loft, I'm sure you could actually muster quite an amount with, with that collection. Be nice for my grandson though, wouldn't it? Definitely one to keep for everyone, because uh, right. they're such nice, nostalgic pieces, for sure. Excellent. Good. Thank you very much for bringing them. Okay, you're welcome. No problem. This is a terrific find, particularly for me. I love this kind of material. Advertisements from the 1950s. How did you come across them? Well, they all come from my father's uh, old chemist shop. He uh, opened it in the 1930s, mid-1930s. Um, unfortunately, early 1950s, he had a, a nervous breakdown, which meant basically that he never threw anything away after that. Um, so we basically got a shop full of various uh, bits and pieces from that era. And you have rescued them when, when the shop closed down? Uh, yes, in the late 70s, unfortunately, he broke his hip. So the relatives were sent in to uh, clear the shop out, and I managed to save some of it anyway. And, but you'd like them as, as items themselves? Oh, very much so. I, I like the 1950s colours and the, and the sense of humour in, in some of the well, like, like this one, yes. The natural laxative for family fitness. It really gets to the point, doesn't it? They seem I mean, to be I'm obsessed, yes. <laughs> I, I particularly love these ones. I mean, this really is the quintessential worm from the 50s. Mm. The red lipstick and, and that wonderful hat. Um, the whole glamour of the period. And of course, this is rather the last decade in which shops had these terrific shop window displays, which all this material is used for. Mm -hmm. I suppose if we're going to put a value on some of these things, quite difficult. Um, certainly, this kind of um, advertisement, you're talking 10, 15 pounds each. But for something as stunning as this, uh, perhaps 40 to 50 pounds. Unfortunately, mm. like often happens, they have been uh, mounted on metal and the rust is now creeping through. Um, so maybe a little bit of makeup would be necessary <laughs> at some stage, perhaps. Earlier on in the show, we looked at James May's small but perfectly formed mini.
Now, if you were to choose a car that was a complete antithesis to that, it will probably be this. Mustang. Mustang is coming. Mustang is coming April 17th. The unexpected, the new Ford Mustang at your Ford dealers. It's big, it's brash, and it's American. Now, who would want a car like this? The answer is Olympic rowing gold medalist James Cracknell. This is your current choice, and you've got one. I have one, yeah. Why? Why this out of everything? Well, my dad sat me down, watched Bullet, and he goes, this is a cool guy, and this is a cool car, when I was about 10 or 11. And then I thought, if ever I get the chance, I have a bit of spare money. But I want to be I'll Steve McQueen. Yeah, yeah. What's special about him? It's, well, it's, it's a kind of design icon, if you look back in the times. It rescued Ford from, from going under, really. It was... Uh, you know, on their first day of, of sales, there were 6,000 cars behind. So it was just sort of revolutionised car design, really, in terms of what it looks like. I'm thinking, How did you find yours? Uh, my wife and I drove on... Our honeymoon was driving across America in a camper van. Uh, oh, which she was chuffed. Yeah. And then uh, I kind of plotted a few routes past some Mustang garages, and then we, we saw them, and then uh, picked one and shipped it over. Well, you were fairly newly married then, so I don't suppose she objected too much to your, your <laughs> indulgence, did she, did it? She's been OK, apart from scan. Well, you never use it, you know, I've been busy rowing, what can I do? But, uh, yeah. <laughs> you imported it from America then? Yeah, yeah, shipped Expensive? over from LA. No, it's only about $700 to, to put it on the boat. And it's also a classic car, so the, you pay less duty when it comes in, you don't pay road tax, you get classic car insurance. It's just the petrol worry that yeah. <laughs> comes back to haunt you. Yeah, and there's not so much how many miles to the gallon, it's how many gallons to the mile. Pretty much, yeah. got a good sounding engine as well. I mean, it's, uh, it's special to drive, you know. It's, I think it's better in a straight line than it is around a bend, but I think that's the same with most American cars. So you committed to this little beauty then? Is uh, you always be a Mustang man? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, it's definitely the car I've always admired most of the classic ones, and, and luckily it's, it's kind of one that's affordable. It's not a, that rare. There, there are so many built. It was the biggest selling production car for, for ages in America. I said the first three series they built were, were really cool, and then it kind of went downhill, and especially sort of 73 when the OPEC oil prop crisis happened, they became very unfashionable because they're so inefficient. But, but now the, the one they released in 2004 is pretty much a modern version of the, of the 68 one, so at least I feel I chose the right one. Or maybe Steve McQueen chose the right one. <laughs> Do you know, 15 or 20 years ago, I had a passing interest in Troika pottery, and this is a piece of Troika pottery. I never paid it much attention, but I appreciated that there was some style in it. Um, I think I never really explored it enough, and I wish I had explored it more, because to be honest with you now, it's an absolute phenomenon. Yeah. It has moved so much in the last few years, it's absolutely incredible. I wonder if you can tell me, how did you come across this piece? Well, um, it was my sister's. She had it, I believe, as a, a wedding present. Yes. And um, uh, and then she moved house, and the style of house was right. more traditional. Right. Uh, it didn't fit and the it interior. It didn't fit. So I had those colours at that time. And you adopted and, and it. And she said, "Well, I like it," and well, I had right. it. Yes. I don't know whether you know much about the Troika pottery. Very interesting pottery. It was essentially started in 1963. Um, it was started by three people. One of the main protagonists really started the Troika pottery as a reaction to the, the high art pottery establishment. In fact, actually, he didn't really like the sort of the, the leech style pottery and things. He thought it was a bit highbrow. Yes. And in turn, they reacted to them as well. They really yes. didn't think the Troika was valid. Um, and they started in the same part of the country, in fact, in, in, down in Cornwall. In Cornwall. Oh, wow. yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And what the Troika pottery did was, in fact, invent a kind of art pottery for the masses. Now, they very cleverly placed it in good department stores like Heels, and it became very popular, and it sold well. People liked it. Mm -hmm. Now, this is quite an interesting piece. It's what I call a moon vase, essentially. Right. And mm -hmm. if we look at it, it obviously has got two sort of different, very different designs, one on mm -hmm. each side. Yes. Yeah. Um, very Scandinavian looking, in fact, yes, it is, actually. Yes. Um, and in fact, if we turn this one up, it is in fact signed here. It says mm -hmm. Troika, obviously, and it says AJ. Now, AJ are the initials for Ann Jones. Now, we can, we can really very precisely date Ann Jones because she worked part-time between 1976 and 1977. Mm -hmm. So you can't get much more accurate than that. So I think it's a very, very stylish little thing. And as I say, it's moved a long way. Uh, I'm an auctioneer, that's my day job, and I have yeah. to be honest with you, I'm very delighted when collections of Troika come in because it's very eagerly chased. Yeah. I don't know, had you ever thought about the value on this? Um, well, 
Well, we've, we've done a little research and we think it's probably valued at over £100. Well, I think you're light on the valuation. Yeah. I have no doubt that this would make yeah. two to three hundred pounds. Really? really? Absolutely. Wow. So it's a really delightful little object. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. I'm very yes. pleased you bought it along. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank right. you. You've brought in quite a few pieces of jewellery today, but I've pounced on this little box because for me, the brooch in here is a little work of art. Now tell me, where did it come from? Uh, from my mother's estate, like, yes. Well, I think this is a salmon, you know, because if we look at the shape of it, the mouth is typical of a salmon. I see. Now, do you know what it's made of here? Well, I would think there may be some, like, small diamonds or something like that, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you're absolutely right. And um, we've got quite a few diamonds, as you can see, set horizontally across the brooch and slightly graduated into the tail here. Yes. And it's a beautiful piece of craftsmanship because we can see even the detail on the fins, yes. which are in gold. Yes. But if we turn the brooch over, we can see it's made of gold on the very back, yes. but then overlaid on the front with silver. Yeah. And that's for a number of different reasons. Do you know why? No, I don't. Okay. Well, silver, of course, is a white metal. And if the diamonds were set in gold, a lot of the gold would reflect into the stone and give them a bit of a yellow tinge. So setting them in silver helps to keep the diamonds nice and bright and white. Now, this also helps to date it because platinum was introduced in the early part of the 20th century for the first time in jewellery. And in fact, it had a really dramatic effect. So we know this is very early 20th century. And if you imagine the shooting, hunting, fishing society, yeah. this would be perfect for a lady dressed in very smart, fitted tweeds um, and perhaps set at her corsage, which would be a typical place for brooches in the Edwardian period. Yes. Now, what about value? Have you any idea? Not really. Um, maybe two, three hundred pounds, something like that. Well, I think the grade of the diamonds and the amount of workmanship that's gone into this, we've got a little cabochon ruby for the eye of the salmon. I see. Makes it a very <coughs> desirable piece. And, of course, fishing is a very popular sport, so in yes. today's market, it's going to be perfect. And I think for insurance purposes, which is a, a replacement value, yes. <clears throat> you ought to be looking at about £2,000. Oh, I see. That so is a bit better surprise. than you thought? Yes, you wouldn't lie to me, would you? <laughs> no, that's what I would say it would be worth for replacement purposes, for insurance. Thank you very much. That is a surprise. We thought it might be rather fun to put James May's cherished mini alongside James Cracknell's car of choice, the Ford Mustang. Now, what's the world record for the amount of people in a Mini? Oh, it was 18 women. I think they were sort of scrawny, supermodel type women. How many women do you think you can get in your Mustang then, James? Oh, I can get quite a few, but I'm normally one at a time. I'm not going there. It's <laughs> nothing to do with me. What I do need to know, though, is which car you would pick as your favourite choice. Now, you can either have the Mini, forget that it does 38 miles to the gallon as opposed to 8 miles to the gallon on the Mustang. Hands up, who would pick the Mini as the car they love best? Oh, not a bad show. OK, and down, and hands up for the Mustang. It's pretty even, isn't it? I think, I think it, needs, it needs a casting vote. So this is my casting vote, because this was my first car. It's not a Mustang. Look at that, 1974. I haven't got the car anymore, but I do still have the bird it pulled. Oh, sorry, dear. Um, <laughs> anyway, thanks, guys, for joining us today. Pleasure. Great fun. Pleasure. Our experts reckon they've seen about 2,500 different things today. We hope you've enjoyed it. And you've enjoyed the Science Museum at Rawton. Come along and have a look. Their website will give you details of when the place is open. But until then, from all of us here, till the next time on the 20th Century Roadshow, bye-bye. <laughs> And that'll be in a fortnight, because next Thursday there's a Question Time Leaders Special at 8.30. Next tonight on BBC One, Steve Leonard's Journey of Life. Drama on BBC Four now, in the passionate love story, 20,000 Streets Under the Sky.